Hi, my name is Ann Dawson, and I like nations. But do I even like about them anyway? I established in my last video that I like flags, but I also like national anthems, statistics, rankings. I even like borders, less so what they are in practice and more so how they are artistically drawn on maps. Basically, I like nations the way they might look on baseball card-esque info sheets, where you can tell me the win-loss ratio of all your wars. I'll trade you a Peru, Bolivia, and a Gold Edition Mexico for your first edition Bavarian Soviet Socialist Republic. It'll complete my collection of failed socialist states. So what I find I like about nations is incredibly trivial. The problem with this way of thinking, though, is that nations aren't just Wikipedia articles. Nations are groups of people, large groups of people even, who share in some sort of common cultural connection. And when I view nations in this baseball card-esque format, I'm really reducing entire peoples and cultures down to tiny, manageable data points. Which is a bad way of thinking about things because people aren't data points, and seeing the world as a bunch of data points is bad because failure to see people as people it leads to terrifying atrocities, to say the least, okay? Can we, can we agree on that? People are people, not data. Nations, however, are how we are trained to view the world. From movies, to history books, to cars, and to food, we are trained to categorize and sort the world through national characteristics. In fact, it's hard to even imagine a world without nations. But indeed, there was once a time where the world was not framed in this way. Feudalism was the dominant political system for a large chunk of human history. Not all of it, of course, but enough of it for me to make my point. Under feudalism, no one really cared about one's nationality. They only really cared about one's loyalty to a liege. A monarch could be a ruler of many different nations, but not be culturally connected to any of them. You could have a Polish king of Croatia, and just the same, you could have an Austrian king of Spain. No one cared about nationality so much because feudalism placed its political legitimacy under the concept of a divine right to rule. A king was a king because God said so, more or less. You could say that under feudalism, the world was not so much divided along national lines as it was divided along religious lines. In our modern era, the divine right to rule is not usually considered a good enough source of political legitimacy. Instead, in our modern world, we place political legitimacy with the support of the people. You know, a government only rules by the consent of the governed. A ruler is a ruler because the people allow them to rule. In a world that places political power in the hands of the people, the nature of the people has become much more important to the political order of the day. Nowadays, appeals to rule are made with promises of some sort of supposed national interest. The religious-based feudal kingdom has made way for the nationalism-based nation-state. We can define nation-states as a government of a people. Nation-states represent attempts to form political boundaries based off of rough geographic approximations of where people of a culture group live. The idea is to essentially form a government of a people in order to express the will of that people. This might at first seem like a better way to organize the world and to establish fair and justified governance, but is it really? I mean, surely it's better than feudal kingdoms and the divine right to rule, but how was the divine right to rule proven? Usually it was proven through the sword. You know, a ruler would conquer a territory, and then they would say it was God that allowed them to conquer the territory, therefore God wanted them to be king. The divine right to rule was essentially a roundabout way of saying they ruled by right of conquest. Under feudalism, religion was a justification for authority, but it was violence that established and maintained that authority. But hey, whatever, who cares really, because I just established that modern nation states do not place their political legitimacy in the hands of God, they place it in a people. However, there are still some problems with that. What if a people of a nation-state happened to live outside of the territorial boundaries established by that nation-state? And what if there are people who don't identify with the primary culture of a nation-state that they happen to live within the territorial boundaries of? History does show us that nation-states try to solve these problems with violence. They solve these problems with the sword. One nation-state might try to invade another nation-state in order to expand its borders in an attempt to include people 
who it believes to be of its culture, but happen to live outside of its current boundaries. One nation state might also decide to employ forced assimilation and even genocide in order to remove or bring into line peoples who are of a culture, but not of the nation state's culture. It sounds to me much like feudal kingdoms, nationalism is merely a justification for authority, but indeed it is violence that establishes that authority. Through these thoughts, I hope that we can see that modern nation-states are truly no more legitimate than a feudal kingdom. Both only exist as the result of violence, and both only justify their existence after the violence through the lens of religion or nationalism. Nation-states in particular are intrinsically flawed because the idea of nations is incredibly fluid and dynamic. Nations, as we identified earlier, are groups of people who share some sort of common cultural identity. However, People change. Cultures change. Cultures go on to mix and mash with other cultures, often producing new unique cultures that continue to go on mix and mash with still other cultures. Nation states, however, stay still. Nations do not create borders, but nation states do. A government based around a culture will be threatened if the culture changes too much. If a culture changes, it could create contradictions with the nation-state based around it. And those contradictions can create antagonisms as people now do no longer culturally identify with the nation-state, and rather culturally identify elsewhere. A nation-state will try and enforce its culture on the people in order to maintain its legitimacy over the people. In order to do this, a nation-state might have to define its culture, which inevitably ends up boiling down all of their unique and rich, tangible cultural connections into text on a legal document. They turn their culture and their people into a data point, a data point that is then used as criteria for inclusion and criteria for exclusion. Nation-states, which assert that their political legitimacy is derived from the people, will insist that they are loyal to the people, but in practice will demand that the people they rule be loyal to the nation-state. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The ultimate goal of a nation-state is inevitably to establish homogeneity between its peoples, so that it may continue justifying its existence. This homogeneity goes against the natural course of culture, and can only be established through force. Fascist power is the natural form of the nation-state. Fascism is the nation-state in its purest form. So what the fuck do I like about nations again? I mean, I said I like flags, national anthems, statistics, rankings, classifications, all things that the state established in order to define itself and the culture it purports to represent. Or is it that I only like these things because this is the only lens I was ever trained to view nations through? And that, because I naturally like nations, I am fooled into thinking that I like nation-states. I like nations because I ultimately like people. I want people to be free, and therefore I want nations to be free. But the only way for nations to be really free is to destroy the nation-states that capture and bound them. So... revolution? It is often said in socialist ideologies that states will naturally wither away after an overthrow of capitalism and the ruling class, the only real beneficiaries of a nation-state and nationalism. However, the most successful revolutions only ever succeeded in overthrowing their capitalist nation-state and, in its place, establishing a socialist nation-state. These socialist nation-states would then go on to try and remove one's national identity in favor of a new socialist national identity. These nation-states would demand loyalty to the nation-state, they would reject uniqueness for the sake of unity, and they would promote conformity towards homogeneity. These policies, which are typical of a nation-state, would lead to these revolutions' ultimate failure either through the collapse of the nation-state as seen in the USSR, or by the betrayal of the revolution by the nation-state for the nation-state at the expense of the people as seen in China. 
From all of this, I can begin to conclude that a government, regardless if it is based on divine right, national characteristics, or even worker solidarity, will only ever seek to maintain itself. A government will not simply vanish or wither away once it can no longer be justified, because that government will always seek to find new justifications for its continued existence. So if there is a revolution, if it intends to be successful and successful in the long term, I would agree that it would need to abolish the concept of the nation state. But I would argue that it must not confuse the abolishing of the nation state with the abolishing of national identity. Simply, we must transform how we think about nations and how we think about nation states. We need to separate these two ideas because they are indeed separate. What I hope we would get out of a revolution, one of many things, would be to free nations from the prison of the nation state. Hello viewers, I'm Tara. If you enjoyed Anne's video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Do you want to learn more about this topic? Check out the list of recommendations in the description below. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time.